So um, we are just waiting for a few new people to come in. It'll take a couple of minutes. Um, hello to everybody on Facebook. Hello. It's so exciting. Hi. <laughs> This is so exciting. Um, so we're gonna wait a couple of minutes just as people come in before we start. Um, but as you can see, my wonderful panelists are all here. This is super, super exciting. Um, and we'll be able to just uh, start talking in a few minutes. Um, I'll give it until about one minute past and then I'll do my introduction. Fantastic, I can see some people coming in already. Okay, it's one minute past and I hear awkward silences, so I'm just going to start. Um, hello to everybody who is on the webinar. Hello to everybody watching on Facebook. Thank you so much for joining in today. We have a fantastic um, and interesting career panel today where we're going to talk about how to um, develop careers in public service, politics, activism, um, all the different pathways that are available to you if you want to make a difference um, as a career and how to do that. Um, I know myself, I'm, I've always been really interested in this kind of career path, but never really knew what options were available to me um, in terms of career. It's like, oh, I wanna make a change, but but how, how do I do that? So um, we have some fantastic panelists here today who are going to just help and talk about how they pursued their careers and um, you know how, how they developed their pathways, what went right, what went wrong, um, and how it's okay to just try out lots of different things. Um, so, um, before we start, I just want to say again, welcome to the EU Citizen Politics Festival. Thank you so much for everyone who has, you know, seen our previous um, webinars and seminars before. Um, this, the reason for doing this is to try and engage young people in politics um, and get them to register to vote and out and mobilizing. Um, we want to make sure that everyone uses their voice apolitical. So we're not encouraging you to vote for a particular person. We just want to make sure that you go out, register, use your voice and vote for whoever you, you want to vote for, you know. Um, so today, as part of that, we want to also talk about other things that you can do, not only getting registered to vote, but if you wanted to, you know, um, campaign, if you wanted to volunteer in a political party, if you wanted to work in activism or as a diplomat or in the UN, um, and we're going to talk about how basically you can do that with some of the stories and anecdotes from our fantastic panelists today. Um, so without further ado, I will stop talking and I will introduce my fantastic panelists. Um, we have Pinar, we have Matt, Vicky, Diane, Aga and Cecilia. And thank you so much everyone for coming. Um, I will just pass over the, the mic to you and let everybody introduce yourselves. Um, in your introduction, I would love to hear um, who you are now, you know, what, what you're doing in terms of your career, where you're working at um, and how you got there. What's kind of your, your transition been maybe from, from university up? Um, so we'll start with Pinar, who's the first person on my screen. Um, thank you so much for coming today, and I'd love to love to hear a little bit about you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, I do have a dodgy internet, so if it cuts off, I'll try to rejoin again. Um, pleased to be here and alongside with different and diverse people from different backgrounds and work fields. Um, I'm currently based in Glasgow in Scotland um, at the moment. Um, so I'm a community worker um, in here. I work with Medical Integration Network, uh, which is a network in the north side of the city, uh, working to welcome people seeking asylum and refuge, also working with the local communities. Um, and we use different wide range of tools um, when people are arriving in, in the community and in society. I'm also involved, uh, just recently started being involved with another group called Refugees for Justice which was set up last year as a result of the incidents which took place um, in Glasgow in Scotland when people seeking asylum were moved into hotel accommodation. Um, so we are uh, working on that for some exciting projects, which I would suggest everybody keeps an eye out for. Um, and how I got here, I guess um, I studied community development uh, at Glasgow University, and then I went to study human rights and international politics. And when I went into studying my master's, I, I had a vision of maybe working with the UN or with the EU or kind of looking at international structures. However, after doing my studies, I decided to stay local and keep working uh, on the ground with the people in the communities and kind of concentrate in Glasgow and in, Sc in Scotland. Um, and that's me at the moment. I also do theatre as well. I do community theatre, so using different tools to engage with the uh, local community and uh, to engage, to raise awareness on different social uh, in issues um, in, in Scotland. 
Um, yeah, I could talk so much more about different things that I do, but I think for now that's uh, enough. And one of the, just before I finish, one of the things uh, that I guess is really important that we campaigned this year, uh, which was, well, it started kind of end of 2019, was the right to vote for people with refugee status in Scotland. And um, as a result, the legislation is, it has changed in 2020. Uh, and now people um, with refugee status and EU citizens uh, does have the right to vote in Scottish elections. So um, I know there's few days to register to vote. So that's just to encourage people who's not already done that to um, yeah, go ahead and register, which is an uh, amazing way of people to engage in, in a democratic society, I guess. And yeah, that's me. Wow, what a fantastic story. And that just proves, you know, if you want to make a change, you can go out and make it happen. That's that's fantastic to hear. Um, and yes, to everyone who's watching, if you haven't already registered to vote, the deadline to register is Monday, this Monday. So make sure you go out and do it. Um, you can do it on the government website. It takes five minutes to do. It's completely free. Um, and it's very, very worthwhile because it means you can use your voice to, to vote. Um, fantastic. Thank you so much. And if anyone has any questions throughout this panel, feel free to put them in the chat if you are on the webinar or comment them on Facebook and we will bring them into our panelists. So thank you so much. The next panelist I would love to introduce is Diane. Diane, would you like to tell us your story and a bit about what you're working on now and, and how you got there? Great, thank you. And um, thanks to everybody. Hello, everyone. Um, so yeah, my name is Diane and I used to work in what is now the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. Um, you might know the Foreign Office and the Department for International Development have merged or they're, they're in the process of merging um, to become a, 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 the, the, the Foreign and um, Development Ministry. Um, but I joined it um, a long time ago now um, when it was the Foreign Office. Um, and to be honest, I never really knew what I wanted to be when I grew up when I was a child. I still have no idea what I want to be when I grow up. Um, so uh, I think one of the things that, that led me to, to, to a job in diplomacy was having that kind of open mind. Um, I had, I still have a foreign mum, uh, a mum from um, Eastern Europe, who was a, a political refugee. Um, my parents met overseas and, and came back to the UK. So I think growing up, I just, I, I lived in an environment that was a bit more global and that, that um, knew that there was a bigger world out there. So it was no great surprise when I graduated um, to end up working in the, in the civil service, having that kind of, uh, kind of public life, wanting to do something um, to the point of this, this seminar about making a change, is making a change as part of the, the government structure. Um, there are lots of different routes into the civil service. There are, you know, direct, you can apply directly for a role. There are apprenticeships now. Um, there are, um, there's the Fast Stream uh, program. There are graduate um, entry programs. Um, I, jo I joined through the Fast Stream um, way back when. Um, and I had a great career in the Foreign Office. I uh, worked in, in South Africa um, and traveled all across Africa as a result. I also worked at the UK's embassy to the, the UK mission to the United Nations in New York. And I was also the principal private secretary um, for the, 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 the permanent secretary. So that was like the chief of staff, the head of the Foreign Office, the head of the diplomatic service, probably my, my best job of my whole career. Um, and, um, and then I, I left um, and actually I then became an activist I then uh, joined uh, the One Campaign, which campaigns against global poverty and preventable disease, a particular focus on Africa, but also looking at things nowadays like global vaccines. Um, so I, I became, you know, in a way, the kind of poacher, having been the gatekeeper within, within government. So I'm very happy to, to look at, to answer kind of questions from an activist perspective. Um, but I, I, I'm, I'm conscious that, that really my role here today is to talk about um, the civil service and diplomacy. Um, so yeah, so as I say, I still don't quite know what I want to be when I grow up. So if anybody has any thoughts for me, I'm very happy to, to hear them. Thanks. Thank you so much, Diane. And yes, that's great. That's another example about how you know, you don't have to necessarily just be one thing. You can start off, you know, going into the civil service, you can go into activism, you can go back, you can do lots of different things. Um, so that's a great, great example of how a career path doesn't necessarily have to just be one thing, uh, which is another thing we're going to be talking about today. And Vicky, I would love to hear your story because I know your career path um, follows the same kind of way of, of doing lots of different things. So I would love to, to hear from you. Hello, uh, my name's Vicky and I <clears throat> am currently working as an independent human rights consultant. Um, my background is really quite varied and quite sort of diverse in the human rights field um, and sort of 
touches on lots of different bits of the human rights world. To sort of summarize it in a very short way, I qualified as a lawyer, so I'm a, a human rights lawyer by background and profession and um, got a master's degree in human rights and civil liberties. But my career path has taken me to work for the UN in Kosovo, to work for the Council of Europe in Strasbourg, um, I had a couple of stints there, to working as a civil servant as a government lawyer, um, so working on national security and terrorism cases, um, to working for the Scottish Human Rights Commission um, in that respect, and then um, back to uh, sort of semi-civil service where I was back actually at the Foreign Office as well, as a human rights advisor to the Foreign Office, advising any Foreign Office staff on um, human rights issues affecting British nationals detained overseas. So um, that cut across the world and um, quite a busy, busy kind of caseload there. Um, to some academia as well, um, teaching human rights law at Surrey University. So suffice to say, my, my human rights career has followed no real trajectory. I've just taken every opportunity that's come my way, generally never said no to anything, um, uh, to, to where I am sort of now um, working on prisoners' rights, prison reform dignity behind bars is my sort of area. Um, but as a consultant, you pick up lots of different pieces of work. So been working with an NGO in Brussels, um, about to start some work with the Council of Europe. So um, that's a very sort of short and quick gander through my own sort of career path and journey. Thank you so much. And yet another example of the fact that, you know, you could work as a consultant, do lots of different things. You know, you don't have to necessarily be refined to one thing, which I think is super important to, to really talk about. Um, as someone who myself was like, what should I do? You always think that you're constructed to one path and that's not necessarily true. So great to be able to have um, all these fantastic panelists to show you know you can do multiple things um, and speaking of multiple things we'd love to introduce our next guest uh, Matt would love to hear you know what what you've been up to what you're working on and, and how you got there oh god um I, I definitely didn't I, I still don't have a clue of what I'm going to do at times and um, just to give you an example my BA you can hear me okay sorry just good yep good my BA was in media and film studies and then I decided to go on to do a master's in sociology and I ended up doing uh, finishing up a phd in tech policy <laughs> so it was a roundabout way and um, i used to work in freelance film for a bit and then i ended up falling uh, i originally wanted to become a documentary filmmaker and i realized that i was basically doing sociology work i just hadn't realized it and then just stumbled along and um, I, I at the end of it i really wanted to become an academic but the more and more i went through the phd process the more i thought maybe this isn't for me i want to get out there and and meet real people and, and uh literally I, I literally i think i would love to grow up and be diane and vicky in the future would be would be my goal at this point and um, how, how amazing they are um and i ended up stumbling into a role where i wrote a couple of concept papers on the idea of cyber peacekeeping and lo and behold to my amazement people took me seriously so that was a first experience. <laughs> and from that I went, it just fell from conversations with uh, the British and Irish Foreign Affairs Departments. And they said, this could be a real thing. And from that, I decided I would go and be a founder at a startup. So I founded my own startup in trying to create uh, tech solutions um, for peacekeeping. Um, so that, that's sort of where I'm at now. Um, how that's going, well, I'll, I'll, I'll like to tell you in six months, we're just at the start. Um, but we're trying to right now initialize why we're different from everybody else. Um, so if you told me a year ago I'd be doing this, wouldn't believe you. If you told me five years ago I ended up doing a PhD, diff different different points. And um, one thing I'd say is just uh, don't. One thing I've definitely learned, and I'll I'll, I'll finish my comment is uh, don't don't think you have one path. When an opportunity comes, just go and pursue it and see what it'd be like. And if it doesn't work out, you can always go back to what you were starting. Don't feel that door's ever cut off. You know, as, as long as you're nice and you don't you don't you don't uh, annoy <laughs> annoy people in the way. Normally, people are always very generous of their time and always help and always very helpful and caring in how they can help you. Thank you so much. And yes, again, another um, example about how you know when you're working in in public service or, or activism, it doesn't necessarily have to be you know in in an NGO. For example, you could start up your your own company. You could work in social enterprise, corporate responsibility, all these different things that are also you know making a difference, which is really important to to keep in mind as well. If you're worried about, I know a lot of us worry about income and things like that because unfortunately, working in public service usually has quite um, a low salary, which is very unfortunate and something that I'd love to campaign 
in against. But um, it is worth noting that there's lots of different ways that you can still pursue something um, if you are financially um, restricted as well. Um, so great, great, great points. The next person I would love to introduce is Aga. I would love to hear, hear from you and hear about your story. Hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Good to be here today. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I just wondering where to start with myself. <laughs> I moved to England 14 years ago. I moved because I wanted to have a more opportunities. It was my decision, uh, which I took it quite lightly. Uh, I didn't regret. And uh, it was wonderful. I set up, uh, firstly, I set up a small community group uh, in place where I moved. And I moved straight to Watford, which is in Hertfordshire, close to London, for those of you who are good with geography. <laughs> and I started to engage with community, firstly, around my East European background, um, and start to build connection with local uh, councillors with the mayor and uh, time to time we suddenly was uh, a good friends and start uh, visiting school more often uh, and uh, surprisingly in 2016 I was elected as a first Polish councillor. <laughs> Since then uh, I enjoyed it, my role. Uh, when you back to 2016 it was uh, quite interesting time for England because uh, two weeks later we had a referendum do we want to stay or do we want to leave so uh, be elected as an unknown person uh, as a councillor who represents people uh, it was huge surprise for myself, because when I started, I never thought that it will be the case. I took it as a challenge. And I always wanted to break the stereotypes about uh, people who are coming uh, from other country and uh, want to set up the live in here. And uh, you know, the all uh, not really nice comment about people who want to take the job and et cetera, et cetera. So I wanted to prove that we are very valuable and worth it people who are the same as you and want to do the same for our country. It's not only your country. It's my country too, because I decided to live in here and bring my children up in here. So it was wonderful to do it. Um, since then, um, I was elected as a vice chairman of licensing committee. Uh, I was quite active. I was a member of budget panel um, and so and on and on with different committees and involvement. Uh, till the last year where I uh, was elected uh, as a chairman and a civic mayor of Watford Borough Council. And once again, I'm the first European who have that role without British passport, which once again, whatever we decided as a country in 2016, we actually saying something different and to the amount of uh, support from residents and people who elected me not only once, to be the representative and the fact uh, what I'm sharing right now is it just uh, an example and a proof to that we are still very valuable and we are still here as a member of England not as a former which is wonderful. Yes, that is so wonderful. And thank you so much. And this is a good segue to rem remind people, sorry, my words are not working today, um, that EU citizens can vote in local elections. The local elections are coming up on 6th of May in the UK. Um, so make sure that you are registered and you're out and voting because you can vote. So, you know, why wouldn't you? Um, so great. Thank you so much. And then our last, but definitely not least, um, panelist Cecilia, I would love to hear from you um, about your story, what you're working on and, and how you got there. Absolutely. Thanks, Antonia, and everyone who's spoken so far. Hard acts to follow. So I'm Cecilia Jastrzemska. It's a mouthful. Don't attempt it. Um, by day, I'm a senior policy advisor in government, heading up a commissions department. By night, I'm vice chair of the National Executive Committee for the Young Fabians, which is a Labour affiliated political think tank comprising of around 7000 people. I'm also my 
My favorite, my, my favorite title ever is a feminist foreign policy officer for the international network. I think that's much cooler than both of those things. So basically I'm a double agent. So where am I in politics apart from these positions? A quick overview for you is firstly, I write for several political publications. So you've got the Oxford Political Review, Backbench UK, Policy Network, The Fabian Review, Global Politics and iGlobal News. I'm also an ambassador for 5050 Parliament. If you don't know what that is, if you do anything today, check that out and become an ambassador. Uh, my policy work on mitigating algorithmic bias in AI against uh, women and ethnic minorities was shortlisted by COGX, which you might or might not have heard of, um, which is a global tech leadership conference. And the other nominee was a United Nations branch. So I found that quite surprising. <laughs> and then more recently, I won the Benazir Bhutto Pride of Performance Award for an address that I made at the International Human Rights Commission well, I was hilariously out of my depth because the rest of the panelists were presidents and prime ministers, and I hadn't actually written a speech or any notes. So again, surprising, but at the same time, what I'll get to next is where I think you can take something from this. The most important question to me is where do you want to be and how can you get there? So I'd like to take you through three things for me that have worked to rise to the political ranks or whichever your field is and establish your own platform in order to become an effective change agent, which we loosely based on my career path. So step one, I'm delighted to say you're halfway there. Show up. Show up to events, your CLP meetings, join the think tanks. If you're interested in those, talk to me afterwards and I'll point you in the right direction for different think tanks and contacts, not a problem. Join 5050 Parliament, join student politics, whatever it is that you can find to join, join it and show up. Stick your hand up, ask some questions, get involved, network. Step two, big one for me, get public speaking training. There is nothing worse than having those sweaty palms, dry mouth, mind running away with you, your mouth not matching up to your mind, and not being able to articulate your conceptualizations, your ideologies, and not being able to do you and your cause justice when you're given the opportunity to, to keep your hand down because you're too scared to ask a question in a really amazing foreign policy debate or wherever you are. So join Toastmasters International, debating societies, Model United Nations, whatever you can find and volunteer for speaking opportunities. The only way to get good is practice. There is no such thing as an excellent, born, innately, intrinsically skilled public speaker. They have had coaching beyond coaching. So stick your hand up. If you've got policy experience and expertise on a particular field and your think tank is doing an event on it, then say, hey, I'd quite like to speak about that. Would you be interested in having me on your panel? Boom, you'd be surprised how many people will say yes. Getting panelists is not easy as Antonio probably knows. That people are busy. And if you've got someone who's willing to impart their knowledge and expertise, which you do have in some field somewhere, they'll be incredibly grateful. And suddenly, after that one point, you are on your way to becoming that thought leader in your field. You're on your way to establishing that credibility. I remember I founded my own company, We Speak International, more of a network, uh, about a year ago. And this was, prior to this, I had joined a different network online on, on a place called Meetup. And I did a bit of coaching for them. I stuck, stuck my hand and said, yeah, I'm happy to coach. And then I had a bit of a choice. I had a bit of a dilemma. The guy who ran it was incredibly misogynistic. I'm very happy to admit that. And he put me down in front of all the other inevitably male coaches. And he would ask questions to the audience like, why do you think men are better than women? And 
I had a similar, ex I had a, I've had similar experiences before and I basically had two routes. Do I want to drop this and leave it because it was becoming absolutely insufferable? Or do I want to pursue it? So I took the second path and I founded We Speak. And let me tell you, so I coach participants twice a week, have done so for about a year. The transformation is incredible between people from people who are complete introverts, who would be flustered, not able to pause, speaking at 100 miles per hour, and also not even being able to take an impromptu table topic until about a minute of silence had gone by. Now I can tell them to talk about a vase and they will give you the most fantastic professional sounding speech about that vase. They will pivot to what they want to talk about. They will have the hands, they will have the points, they will have the techniques. So get some public speaking training. And the third is run for election or go for that position that you want. Keep an open mind. Vicky and Diane have both outlined expertly exactly how varied one's career trajectory can be and how that's not a bad thing. There is no linear path, there's no set structure that you need to follow. So don't be worried about opportunity costs. Instead, take those opportunities, grab that bull by the horns, and where there aren't opportunities, make them for yourself. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much. It is so wonderful to have such an impressive panel here. So thank you to everybody um, for introducing yourself and thank you for those top tips as well, because uh, just reiterating, it's so important to have public speaking experience just to be able to feel comfortable. Um, and you should never say no, just like what Vicky was saying, you know, when you get it on opportunity, don't say no, take it. You never know where it'll lead you. Um, if it leads you somewhere you don't like, that's okay. You can always change. You can always do something else like Cecilia did. Um, so the opportunities are endless. So don't be too afraid to grab them because you never know what could happen. Um, so Everyone who's watching, again, feel free to throw in your comments um, and questions. We'd love to include them. But building on um, what we've been talking about, I would love to ask the entire panel, what has been the biggest or most memorable, memorable learning experience that you had in your career? And I'll open this to the entire panel. So if anyone has a particular um, experience that they want to talk about, feel free to, to raise your hand or to jump in and would love to, to hear from you. I'm not gonna cold call in case, um, you know, it's quite a difficult question, but um, yes, I would love to hear from everyone about your most memorable experience or something that, that really changed your, your thinking in your career. I can start to share my experience, uh, which I will be remember always uh, back to 2016 when I was uh, elected first time as a councillor. Uh, it was 6th of May, funny enough, it was the 6th of May, uh, my colleagues who was on the hall that uh, day, they cried because it was a historical moment for them, knowing that we have a referendum two weeks after. And uh, when the referendum uh, took place and my town decided, the people who lived in my town, they decided that uh, by small percentage, it was 4%. They decided that they want to leave UK, EU. So um, it was surprised by everybody. It was only 4%, but it's still, they want to leave. They didn't want to remain. I had a, such a wonderful and powerful messages from all people across Watford who emailing to me, calling to me, messaging to me, saying that we don't care about the color of your passport. You are one of us. You are one with us. And we never will be put that between us because regardless of the color, we are together in it. It was wonderful to have support then and to continue with the support till now. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That's so wonderful to hear. And especially, you know, with all the kind of um, hostility and, and animosity that is out there, it's it's really important to remind yourselves that, you know, there are people who really care and, you know, want to want to bust you up instead of tearing you down. So that's such a wonderful experience. Um, thank you so much. And does anyone else have any um, learning experiences that, that really, really shapes, you know, their their career? If not, that's OK, but I would love to hear hear from everyone. If I, could, if I could just jump in, um, 
one thing that's took me a long, long time to realize is my time is precious. And I, I don't know if you feel if you're starting out, you feel you have to say yes to everything. I agree with Cecilia, you take opportunities as you, as you totally can, but you, you don't value your own time and you need to be strategic with it. And whatever mechanism you find the way, to, I, I go for the Warren Buffett method or on that day, what is the most important I will attend to. I'm, I'm not very good at mapping everything out. And anytime I saw anybody in their diaries were mapped out to the final minute, gave me complete anxiety. I thought, I don't operate that way. And I thought that was the idealized way to work. Figure out how you can do your own time management. And remember your time's important. Make sure you always carve out those moments of family and people you care about as well. Because I think when you can be really busy, you forget about that and sometimes they suffer. And it's very important to have them along the journey as well. I always think so. Time management, I don't know why I'm being I'm making it such a boring subject, but it is really important because you're of value. And I think that gets missed an awful lot. And if you're of value, your time's valuable. Completely, completely. As someone who's currently doing a master's and has two jobs, um, I completely agree with that. But that in itself, I think is a learning experience. You know, once you kind of check on too much and realize that this, the, this is just, you know, I can't, I can't do this anymore. Um, it's definitely a way of framing, okay, that's not what to do in the future. And I think making mistakes is so important to be able to understand, you know, your, your bandwidth. And we really do need to stop glamorizing burnout and working, you know, overworking and, and all of these things, especially I think as a young person who's trying to make their career, they're, they're trying to just give it their all. And yes, you should be giving it your all, but also take into account that your all also includes prioritizing your mental health and self-care exercising having a social life like these are all really important things to do as well so that's fantastic advice as well um moving on to this idea of advice as well if everyone has more um experiences like learning experiences please feel free to bring them in but i would love to hear from from the panel about what are the the first steps that someone who has just kind of started their career in you know public service activism politics um should take what do you think are the, those very first steps in in getting involved yeah, Vicky, go ahead. So this is something that I, I kind of can speak to because I mentor and support young professionals who are looking to break into the human rights sector. And I think there are sort of two or three really key things that, that um, young professionals can be doing as of now. Um, and the first is kind of um, starting to write and starting to curate yourself as a sort of mini expert quote unquote, in your area of human rights law. You can't be an expert in every area of human rights law, but starting to write, and as Cecilia says, becoming a thought leader. You don't need to write a huge, great tome for the Harvard Law Review, but you can sort of start writing for a blog or a sort of getting a presence and getting visible there um, so that when you um, apply for that job or something, you can say, well, actually, I've written about this um, in, in such and such a publication. So starting to kind of build that portfolio behind you. The second sort of thing is, is to kind of get that on the ground experience. Um, and I always, always encourage and implore people to try and find paid opportunities. Um, there's no reason why internships should be unpaid, particularly in my sector, the human rights sector, it feels ethically wrong for so many reasons that people should not be paid for their work. So finding um, an experience of value to you. So not only are you helping that organization, but what, how, where and how can that organization assist you in terms of skilling up, in terms of building your contacts within the human rights community um, and, and sort of, you know, helping meeting the, the, the key people in the, in the human rights world or that particular bit of the human rights world. So those are two tangible things that individuals can do. Um, and then networking, finally, just getting out there, reaching out to people um, by, via LinkedIn, um, asking for an informational chat um, about not asking for a job, asking how did they get to where they got to? What was their own journey? And you can be sure that um, they will give you some insights and advice um, that, uh, that will help you as you go on your own journey. So for me, that, that's the kind of thing that I'm always talking, advising young professionals to do. Maybe I can Thank just- Thank you so much. Yeah, go ahead. Just add to, to Vicky's point, because um, I think one thing I would say to, to people, not just starting out in, in their careers, but even people, um, you know, at, at my age and my stage who are also thinking about what to do, is not to be afraid of having those conversations that rule things out. I remember really clearly when I was thinking about leaving the Foreign Office, but wasn't entirely sure what to do next. 
I looked up a number of people that had left the Foreign Office before to find out what they did. And there was one, one person who was on as a comment to uh, Lloyds of London, the, the, the huge um, insurance company. Um, and um, I went along to Lloyds, he took me for a coffee. He, he gave me a bit of a tour of the building, of the trading floor, and then we sat and had a coffee. I was there for a couple of hours, two hours of my life that I will never get back. And the, the, the number one thing, I mean, I really, really value the, the, the man that I met um, and, and, and his time because I learned in those two hours that, that financial services were not for me. I wasn't excited. It didn't align with my values. It wasn't something that I, I couldn't envisage myself in that building. And so for, for the investment of two hours, it, it helped me um, kind of clear a pathway that that was a whole part of, uh, of, um, of a career that I didn't want to pursue. So um, so I kind of joked to say it's two hours of my life that I never get back, but that was a really smart investment and I'm grateful to the, to the person that I met. So don't be afraid that um, if you have a coffee with somebody and, and you feel like, oh, it doesn't quite feel like me, or you reach out to them for some advice and it doesn't quite match, that wasn't wasted time. That That's really helpful in, in, in kind of in the jigsaw puzzle of working out, well, what do you want to do um, while um, kind of carving out things that you don't want to do? Yes, thank you so much. And again, I think it, what we're hearing here is it's okay to do multiple things. It's okay to kind of learn um, as you're going and that, those kind of learning experiences. It's okay to not not necessarily make mistakes. I mean, it is okay to make mistakes, but also just to to do things and to try things out. And if they don't work right, that's okay too. You know, it doesn't have to be the biggest thing. Um, Darren, we actually have a question here for you in the chat. So we'd love to hear um, what are the pros and cons of being a diplomat? Uh, what a great what a great question i can speak much more freely now that i'm an ex-diplomat because I, I don't feel that i'm being listened to by uh i won't be reported back back um what are the pros well you know decisions foreign policy decisions are made by governments and they're made by ministers and being part of that machinery um is is, is a real privilege and um being able to influence um your own system but also being able to influence the the systems of other countries um, and, and building alliances, building um, uh, trust, building relationships with other diplomats um, and, and kind of moving things forward in the real world was something that I always enjoyed. I remember what, uh, one of my, my roles was heading up the United Nations uh, political team in, in London and I remember waking up one morning um, uh, several years ago to listen to the, the, the seven o'clock news on Radio 4 and the top three headlines were, um, and I can't remember the order, but it was a, a, an Iranian nuclear problem. North Korea was testing a ballistic missile and there was a, a problem in um, Lebanon, um, in, unrest in Lebanon. And I literally lay in bed and I was like, that is my entry. That is, those are the three issues I'm working on right now. I better go to work. So, so to feel as if I was working within some real life issues to try and um, kind of make the world a better place um, was really uh, exhilarating. At the same time, um, you know, on the cons, on, on, the, on the arguments against being a diplomat is uh, you can get a bit frustrated because here we are several years later, several years since I woke up in bed at seven o'clock and we've still got an issue with Iranian nuclear. We still, you know, North Korea is, is still um, a, a difficult um, issue for, for diplomats and Lebanon is not a peaceful um, place, place to live. So you might feel, well, it, isn't it a bit futile as a diplomat? You're not actually making any difference in the world. You're just kind of moving along the papers and shuffling them um, uh, for, the, for the next time around. And indeed, when I left the Foreign Office and became an activist, I had more meetings in 10 Downing Street in, in my role working as a campaigner um, than I did while as a civil servant you know, we were able to push the government, we were able to, to, to be, um, to create more ambition, because we were able to be more political, we were able to work across, uh, I don't mean party political, but we were definitely able to build alliances within Parliament, and being able to push from the outside. So you, you might feel that you can make more of a difference from being outside of the machine than being inside. Um, I, I think that is then kind of a, a wider question then, if you, if, you're, if you want to make change, what sort of change do you want to make? Because you can be within government, where the decision is taken. You can be an activist um, where you're pushing from the outside and, um, and pushing for great ambition. You could be a politician where you're building um, your own uh, base and you're building a mandate to make those decisions in the first place. So depending on what, you, what your kind of character is and the nature of the change that you want to see, um, you know, the civil service and diplomacy may well be for you, or it might be that you're, you, you want to take a different route. 
Thank you so much. Yes, and I think that that idea of of immediacy, I think, is really important to bring up as well. Those people who you know want to make change that sometimes you can have that immediate change and it's fantastic, but sometimes it takes a lot of work. It can take years. You might not see anything happening, but that doesn't mean it's not happening. It doesn't mean that you're not helping and, and making an impact. So it is really important, I think, to, to get in that mindset of what kind of change are you looking for and how comfortable are you with, with waiting a little bit to, to see that change. So thank you so much, Diane. I would love to ask um, Pinar, actually, your experience with campaigning as well and you know how, how a person could kind of get involved with that um, over, over time as well. Yeah, I was actually just going to contribute to what Diane was talking about. I think one of the key things is what I've been doing and what we do with the groups I work is uh, outlining and doing a campaign planning. And I think that is extremely beneficial at the very start of the process, whether what your object of the, the subject of the campaign is and ident identifying um, the campaign, I think. Um, one of the things that we do at the moment is um, when you're doing a campaign, if it's a very overall big thing, I think it's you need to be realistic about what you can achieve in the time space. So I think having a narrow and focusing on a campaign. So whether that's the one that we worked about right to vote, so something that is could be achievable in a short space of time. And the bigger the campaign is, the bigger you have to be realistic about how long it's going to take. I love, um, I'm a very visual person, so um, I love doing mind maps. And that's how my kind of head works. <laughs> so obviously when you start writing down and um, that's one way, but when you do mind mapping and you you identify what the goal is and then what the barriers is and who your allies is, I think, um, and mapping that out is one of the key aspects. And I think what already been said about um, not giving up and um, understanding from the very beginning when you do a campaign, uh, it might take years or it might take months. So being realistic about the time scale and not being defeated when when you don't achieve that campaign within six months. Um, I think that's one of the key things. And I think um, if you're working in a field that you're passionate about, everything will follow afterwards. Um, and you have to be, I think, passionate about whether that's human rights, whether that's um, refugee rights as human rights or asylum rights. Um, and it's really important that you're passionate about the field. Um, if not, or if you don't like your job, then it will be very miserable for you and for the people that you're working with. Um, one of the things that I had um, over the years learned is the involvement of the people that you're advocating for the issue. Um, as somebody who lived through the asylum system and now working in the field, I, I think the value of uh, involving people with lived experience is extremely important. And I think that's where the true change and uh, campaigning takes place. Because if you are continuously advocating on behalf of somebody, then their voice is not going to be heard uh, and you're not going to have a true feeling about what the issues are uh, that, that, that they are facing. Um, I mean, the, the example of the Right to Vote campaign, which was done with uh, our organisation and with Scottish Refugee Council and Voices Network of British Red Cross, um, was also highlighting the importance of partnership and networking and working together when you're doing uh, campaigning and when you're advocating for change. Uh, and I think that's something that in the third sector or even um, you know, in, in, in our kind of area of work that we need to work more on because we are uh, at the end of the day kind of advocating and working towards a better asylum and immigration system. Um, so we need to bring the expertise and the experiences we have within the field and the sector to, to make the changes. Um, just going back to kind of that memorable moment, I think um, when we, we went to the Scottish Parliament, when, the, when they were uh, debating the legislation for the voting, and I think that was such a beautiful space and moment when uh, the amendment for refugees uh, was passed and included in the change of legislation, um, which now means, you know, with, people in Scotland with refugee status can vote in uh, the local election. And that was such a memorable moment. I think people will remember uh, and it will provide people voices for voting in, in, in the future elections. Um, yeah, so I think the mind mapping is the key <laughs> Being, uh, and involving creative elements when campaigning um, and thinking, you know, not being afraid to like, take risks and chance. Um, I mean, I use theatre as a way of uh, when we do campaigning or role plays. Um, um, that's another key aspect as well. Um, yeah, that's what I would say for campaigning. Um, yeah. 
couldn't go, agree more. I'm happy to come in after you, Pina. So, I mean, I've already outlined a couple of steps, but I was thinking about learning experiences for me in my career. And actually a lot of that has come from conflict. And I think in our careers as politicians, as diplomats, as human rights lawyers, and everything else, we're going to come up against difficult people. We're going to come up against people who want to push us out of the way to take our platform, don't want, to, want, don't want us to have that platform or fight for that cause. Whether that's from a purely egotistical reason or whether that's a monetized financial incentive that they've got to shut you down. And I was thinking as everyone was talking about some of the things that were quite pivotal for me. So for example, I remember a time where I organized a really interesting foreign policy debate with some brilliant speakers and had everything ready, the date, the Zoom link, you know, everything, everything was good to go. In fact, it wasn't even Zoom, it was, it was physical. I just assume it's Zoom in these pandemic times. Anyway. And I remember one of the guys on my committee said, I don't think you should chair it. I think you should get an external chair. And I was like, why not? I mean, I've organized it. I've done the work for it. I've written about it. I know about it. I know what questions I'm going to ask. And I just thought, no, you know, why on earth do you need to get someone external to do something that I've put my time and effort and energy into? And as Matt outlined, your time is your most precious commodity. So if you've made the effort, you should get the credit and credit all of the other people who are involved in that as well. And I remember other times where, say, for example, a woman on a different committee had a go at me for contacting MPs to get them to do events with us. And again, I was saying, well, this is a win-win for us. You've got lords. MPs and the Shadow Foreign Secretary ready to have an, an event with us. What could you possibly have uh, to, to, how could you possibly have a problem with that? And again, it was one of these things where I think she wanted to chair them all, or she felt like I was upstaging her. And ultimately, again, did I sack it off? Did I cancel the requests? Not a chance. And in, and because of that, we had a huge uh, increase in membership and engagement and in people asking questions. And generally, our, our whole society benefited as, as a result. There have been times when, when, you've, when I've had meetings that people have just spoken completely indirectly, passive aggressively at me uh, to try and criticize me or put me down. And ultimately, I also have to say that as, as women, we do face the likability conundrum. We face a, a pretty specific kind of concept where if you are too quiet, you're not taken seriously. And if you're too loud, you're characterized as, bo as bossy, as cold, not as the way that, that men are characterized, which is leaders, executives, presidential, so you have to recognize if you're a woman and identify as a woman that you are going to face that and then say to hell with it. So if you've done the work, take the credit, credit others around you, make sure you're also lifting other people up as you go along. Because one of the things I remember speaking to some old Fabian chairs, mostly MPs, Lords, you know, people very high up in politics, one thing that one woman said stuck with me and will always stick with me, which is that don't look above you, look beside you. The people on your committee now, your friends, your contacts, your, your colleagues are probably the people who are going to rise with you. So don't always be thinking, oh, we have to platform this MP. We have to platform this amazing MEP or head of the UN. Platform the people around you actually invest in those relationships because they are going to be the next MPs with you, the next lawyers with you. And when they rise to the top, you rise to the top. When you rise to the top, make sure they rise to the top. So don't always look above, look beside you and look behind you. That's my advice.
Yes, Matt, I'd love to hear your voice. I, I, I actually just wanted to come in with a question to the whole panel, building off what Cecilia said, um, just about building your tribe or building your village. Um, you know, I would like to believe, you know, I very much come from a try and be a feminist as best as I can by know at times I catch myself. There are forms of internalized misogyny that I have enacted and I have to call myself out on it. You know, in building that tribe and trying to create an, an equal space um, uh, for gender in, in like any form of culture and from the different arrays, from the different array of um, backgrounds. And what are your best advice or approach to do that? Because I, 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 I need to do more work on that myself and I need to think about how I can be more inclusive because I'm, I'm trying to, but I know I can be pushed even further. But sometimes I don't see a direct path on how I can get to that point to try and be. Because I know, yeah, that's my question. Yeah, come on. Matt, it, it's a very good question. But what I would say, and I start with, you, you need to put yourself in the center. And it's great that you're asking for advice and uh, you sharing with us that it's something what you're a bit struggling, but you cannot forget that you are in a center and regardless what people tell you and give you advice, uh, you creating yourself. And uh, at some point in the line, you will find you as a real, because what it, uh, it's important for me and I think it might be important for you too, is at the end of the day, you need to look in the mirror and say to yourself, uh, it was a good day. I have nothing against myself. I did a brilliant job. And quite often when you're talking with people and you're meeting with uh, people with different background, uh, um, different job title, um, different uh, commitment and passion, they will have a different view about yourself, about themselves. So really, uh, sometimes it's good to step back and listen yourself and see where are you sitting with all this and remember that you are the most important and what you can take from other people is the lesson and say to yourself that you need to learn from experience and mistake from others. That way you might protect yourself and do not do it again. This is what someone gave advice to me. And uh, when I'm looking uh, at myself through the years where I started, where I am right now, and what way I need to go through and how many times I stop to reflect where to go, I never stop to be myself because who you are represent who you want to be in the future and people do like or dislike you because of you. And it's not absolutely normal, but you need to accept yourself. Very good question, Matt, really important. And I hope that all people can take it who are listening to us right now or maybe uh, seeing the records later to remember that you need to do the first step and don't try to be someone who are not you are, because who you are is the best value of yourself. Thank you. Just, just to add to that, that's really powerful. I think, um, I think having that space for reflection, like you said, is the most important thing. And critically thinking about what you are doing, and not just doing it for the sake of doing it and going along with things just because that's the time and that's what people asked you to do. And I think once you get caught in the moment of just saying yes to everything and just keep doing it, then yeah, you, you end up losing what you do. And then also you burn out and then you don't know what you're doing. You're just being used by what everyone else is telling you to do, or you're just being dragged from one place to another. Um, one of our, there's a really great book called um, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. I don't know if you know from Paolo Fieri, and he talks a lot about um, how people are being uh, dehumanized and how people then end up uh, being oppressed into a state of mind that they don't critically think about what is going on and then 
that where you need a space for reflection and critically thinking about what is going on. I mean, this is a little, the topic is kind of, sorry, I'm just drifting a bit to about um, people recognizing critical thinking and oppression. But I think uh, whether in the field that you're working, whether it's about migration or um, about any sort of social inequality, it's, it's really important that also the community that you work with, they are critically aware of what is going around them uh, and they're not being naively just dragged along with the cause um, and that's something that I maybe naively is not the right word but that's something that I really passionate about when we campaign on works that people are also aware of their rights um, and um, as somebody who because I went I uh, faced uh, detention when we were seeking asylum um, to, to explain the experience people used to come up and say can you speak at this platform at that platform and you end up just speaking at different places but you never had that moment of reflecting and thinking about yourself and right now i'm really passionate about having that space for people and um, actually when whatever experience they faced um just to respect their stories and it is also to respect their experiences um and I think if you're a community worker or if you work with people who directly had an effect of whatever the situation is, that's one of the key things that you need to recognise is people's experiences and respect people's experiences and have a platform where they can, um, yeah, experience, um, kind of platform where they can feel safe or uh, have that support mechanism. Um, sorry, I've kind of drifted the topic, but um, I think if you're working with communities, it's, it's really important that you have these skills and you have this uh, knowledge and thinking behind all the time uh, when you're working directly with the people and um, yeah Thanks. thank you so much and I'm so I'm cognizant of the time that we only have four minutes left and I want to wrap up on time to just be respectful of all the panelists time because again as we pointed out time is your most precious um, asset that you have so let's be respectful um but the last question I have there's a question here in the chat and I'm going to combine it with with my final question so the question in the chat is about how EU citizens can get involved if they don't necessarily want to apply for British citizenship. But I'm also going to combine that with my last question to everybody here, and I would love to hear everyone, so please try and keep your um, answers short. Um, with what kind of action items can people who are looking to to make change get involved, whether that's you know a, a specific organization that you're working on now, I would love to hear about that, um, or whether that's just a kind of top tip that you give to, to people. Please again, try and keep your answer short, but I would love to hear from everybody about that kind of action item um, moving on. Maybe I, I can just uh, throw out there and say, I mean, it might be obvious, but you can't join the Foreign Office or the, the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office um, if you're not a British citizen. You can have more than one nationality, but but one of them must be British. So it does close the door to, to, to that option. But there are a ton of other options within um, civic life, in local government and in national government for people that want to get involved in, in the kind of um, in the, the 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 official capacity, but then um, you know drawing on 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 where my career has been, also getting involved from the outside in the campaign group or for a charity um, is obviously another way of making real change um, within communities. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. My quick tip I suppose would be to join an organization which is which has links with the people whose careers you would like to imitate or where you would like to be so if you wanted to be an MP join the Fabians or join a similar think tank because I mean in my in my Fabian career generally for ages people thought that was my actual full-time job I've probably had access to, you know, 50 MPs and Lords and presented at conferences and written policy I would never have written if it weren't for that think tank. And that's much more than my role in the civil service. You know, I might speak to the Secretary of State sometimes, but I actually have more clout having been in the Fabians and having a voice there. And it's like Matt said, building your tribe and building your village finding like-minded thinkers, finding people who are mentally aligned with you, but also cognitive diversity and finding people who challenge you as well and make you develop your thinking, make you develop your answers to things and not just have a yes man echo chamber going on. So I think, think about where you want to be like point X and then work backwards. Okay, what's affiliated to point X? Who is at point X and then 
how can you get in touch with them? Who can you speak to? And how can you essentially get to that point X? Um, for me, I'm part of the uh, Global Shapers by the World Economic Forum. Like there's hubs all around the UK and they accept anybody. Uh, UK and Ireland, if anybody's tuning in or around Europe, there's like over, do you know how many hubs? There's over like over 500 hubs around in different cities. I'd really encourage you to reach out and go speak to them. You will find the most diverse range of people and it's a very welcoming space and everybody is so giving of their time. And if you want to try and create change, you have a team ready there that will jump on a bandwagon with you and try and create that change in lobbying politicians and trying to get something done. We in Northern Ireland have done like mental health projects and tried to help uh, communities from the conflicts. So anything at all you can do, I would definitely join in of that. Yeah, Vicky. But for me, um, I think my best piece of advice is to build up your skill set, because we can't do any of this work without being skilled and technical in whatever it is. So for my world, it would be sort of building up your skills in oral advocacy skills, written skills, drafting skills, fundraising, project management. So having those really technical skills that you can then sort of use to whichever cause it is that speaks to you. So that would be my point. Thank you, and Panara and Aga? Yeah, just to add to that, I think, um, I think understanding what the issues are and thinking local, and that's something that I'm really passionate about, and doing your research, I think, um, to see what the, um, what the problems that is happening in your community at the moment, and then being involved at a very grassroots level. And I think that's where uh, you end up building up your skills in public speaking, like Vicky said about, uh, you end up having different experiences and meeting other people and uh, networking that way. And I think remembering that to get involved in something that you're passionate about, because once you're passionate about something, then I, I think that there is nothing that could stop you um, to achieve whatever you want to achieve, yeah. I would say to anybody who would like to be involved for locally, nationally, just to do it. it. It it don't need to be very complicated. If you do not feel very strong about politics, just find a local group what you can join. Uh, if you do not have a really any local group or you're not aware, uh, the simplest way to find out what is going on in your area, wherever you live, is your local councillors or your local council. They will be more than happy to guide you and help you decide where you want to go. And this is the best and simple way to start and engage with any place where are you living right now. And if you are interested to take part in politics and you are European nationality, um, currently you can represent uh, local government, you can be a councillor, you can stand up for election, you can vote in local election. However, if you're thinking about MP role, you need to have a British nationality and it's something what's to take place. But before that is a bit of career path you need to go through and be selected as a, a, a parliament uh, a candidate. So it's a bit to do with that, but it's still possible. and whatever is achieved, uh, whatever you can achieve what you want. So just go for it. And if you don't know where to start, just drop me an email or text me and I will be more than happy to give you advice. I would love to see more young European and European is standing in local election, national election. It's really, really, really lovely to see that they are engaging more. And we need you, you need to remember it's your voice, it's your future, just do it, stand for yourself. It will be lovely to see you. Thank you so much. And thank you so much to all of our panelists as well. The one last thing to answer this question is we also have the, the Young Europeans Network, which is, you know, ages from, from 16 to 30. So if you're a young, um, either UK or EU citizen or, you know, any citizen really, but you're interested in that, those kind of matters, you can join us and we would be happy to help. We offer lots of training and lots of ways to get involved. Um, but yes, just to echo what everyone says, there are so many different ways that you can get involved, whether that's, you know, as a hobby or whether that's your career path, you know, there's lots of different things and if you're ever confused just reach out to someone you know I'm sure that they would be happy enough 
to give you their top tips to try and guide you a little bit you know the whole point of of being in the in the public service or activism or politics is that we all care you know and we always want to want to help others um realize that because we're all working towards the same goals which is just making the world a better place and making change so um thank you again to all of our fantastic panelists today you have been so inspiring so informative and and this has been such an interesting um engagement i wish it could go on for longer but you know i do want to be respectful of everybody's time so thank you for everyone for watching and thank you to our incredible panelists um thank you again um and we will end the the webinar there <laughs>